commitment and a commitment to great sacrifice to serve your people. Um, I think we should begin in trying to understand those powerful influences in your life. They talk about, psychologists talk about character defining moments, those moments in one's life that shape a person and reveal one's core essence and values. You mentioned, I'm looking at the screen and everyone can see the screen and behind you, you mentioned to me before there is a song written by one of Israel's great composers dedicated to those soldiers, young soldiers. We're talking about soldiers in their early 20s or maybe even late teens who gave their lives defending Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Tragically, your brother was one of them and you have the ID tag behind you. And obviously you live with this every single day. Please share with us all this event and the impact it had on your life. Thank you, Yosef. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I'm privileged to speak uh, to you, my brothers and sisters. Uh, behind me here on the wall, uh, I'm showing with the cursor, is the song, the picture of my brother on top, and the ID tag is here, still stained with his blood and the soil of uh, the Golanites. My brother was among those few tankers who defended our country against mass of Syrian tanks in the Yom Kippur War. Only 180 Israeli tanks defended the Golanites at the first 24 hours against about 2,000 Syrian tanks. And um, his last battle was on the way to assist my paratroopers, my friends in the in Telsaki position, south of Golanites. Menachem Mansbacher was the commander of the Telsaki. They were surrounded by thousands of Syrians asking for assistance, and my brother with his company moved to help them. He was shot by Syrian tank 50 meters in front of him. They started the battle from 2,000 meters and then 1,500 and 1,800. And but he was shot while shooting other three Syrian tanks on the left of his tank. He was the only survivor from his tank. There are four members in, in each tank. He flew out. He was thrown outside and um, bleeding a few meters from his tank. He could be saved. He could be survived if someone came and put a bandage on his left leg, which was bleeding. And he was left behind. Um, sorry to say it, not one day, not two days, not three days, not four days, not five days, not six days, seven days. Seven days, you know, the, the universe was created in seven days. My brother was left behind seven days, evacuated only on Saturday, a week, later, October 13, by Professor Yaakov Neeman and uh, Judge Hanan Efrati, with the commander of the uh, uh, surviving team, um, evacuation team. And he was dead already. And um, the rumors said both of us were killed, me and my brother. I was fighting at that time. I'm the elder one in my family. I was 22, he was 20. I fought in Sinai against mass of uh, Egyptian tank, and um, there were many moments I thought I won't see the, the minutes later, not the days. Um, at the end of the war, I arrived to telephone call home. My mom raised the telephone, and uh, first, my first question was, what about Iran, my brother? She said, we lost Iran. We have no Iran anymore. I came home, I continued to the Golanite, where we're not sitting Shiva. Because I don't know if you were, but all our losses in the Yom Kippur War, about 3,000, were buried in temporary cemeteries. The funeral happened only 11 months later. There was nothing to do at home. I continued to the Golanites. I found his burnt tank. I did pictures of his tank. And then I continued to hospital. I found it some of his soldiers 
investigated them and learned, shockingly, learned that he was left behind. So one defining moment in my life is discovering the simple fact that my brother was left behind. The news burned tank, I did my oath. I did my oath to do my best and never ever leave a wounded soldier behind, just like that. Also, I, I decided to continue as fighter, as soldier, as commander. And most of my service, 34 years service, most of it battles and battles and battles and battles. And I lost many, luckily I'm here alive, but I lost many along this course of wars and actions uh, and operations. And my brother was the reason to continue serving my country as fighter, as commander, with my oath for him inside. Never leave a wounded soldier behind, just like that. Now, the second defining moment, 11 years after the Yom Kippur War, 1984, January 6, our second child was born. It was only natural to give him the name of my brother. We named him Iran, and as parents, we wanted him to be better than us, more successful, more talented, a source of pride. So natural for parents to will and pray that the child will continue the legacy of the family. At the age of eight months, he was diagnosed after many tests along this month. And then the last test with, uh, we were facing, Didi, my wife and me, facing psychologists telling us, your son is having a combination of autism and retardation. That, this is the specific word she used, retardation. I think first time in my life I heard the word autism. She said combination of autism and retardation. And then she said, probably, he will never speak. Probably he will mentally stay child forever. So what do you mean? She, she said about the age of uh, three, four months. That's it. That's my assessment. Didi, my wife, started crying. And then the next two years was ongoing debate between us how to continue managing our life if our son has no opportunity even to be graduated of kindergarten. I want to tell you that uh, in retrospect, after speaking with uh, thousands of parents, I want to tell you that uh, our child sit on the most sensitive nerve of our existence. It's our continuation. It's our hope, the hope of the family. And when Families face this situation many times, many times, mother or father or sibling want to commit suicide, just like that. When I was Major General Commander of the Israeli Southern Command, I gave interview in the circumstances of a grandfather who killed his autistic granddaughter and committed suicide. And it happened from time to time. You can't believe how much agony, stress, suffer, um, frustration parents are facing while raising a child who formally, by a uh, doctor's diagnosis, has no future. Um, I think we change our mind about uh, parents' behavior when he was about two years old. What happened at that day? We saw him smiling. You know, we saw him smiling, and, and at this moment, I told Didi, my wife, look at him. He's happy. He's happy. He's, he's, he got his own world. And if he got his own world, you know, that only us crying, feeling the burden of uh, no future. But uh, he may be happy. Maybe, you know, maybe he's telling us, my dear parents, I know you expected a successful child. 
my dear Pence, look at me. I may be, I may be happy. Are you ready, my dear Pence? Are you ready, my dear dad? Are you ready to give up? You dream that one day I'll be Nobel Prize winner or successful person or pilot or engineer or lawyer or whatever. Are you ready to give up all this achievement and satisfied on one thing, one thing, to give a smile to my face? That's all. Are you ready, my dear father? That's it. I think at this age, two years old, about two years old, when we saw that he got his own world, at this moment, Didi, my wife and me decided, yes, we won't be ashamed on his presence. We won't hide him. Many parents hide, many families don't tell. We decided to speak about him, to tell. We decided to fight for him. And he was the greatest professor of my life. This child has never, has never made eye contact. This child has never said one word, never said Abba, dad, mom. Not even one word. And this child was the greatest professor, the greatest educator and teacher of my life. What he taught me, you know, we say never judge someone until you come to his place. What we judge, we judge people without coming to their place. So this child, without saying one word, like told me, my dear father, come over, come over, get inside my shoes, come over, let's go together and see the state of Israel, the only Jewish state in the world. Let's see what is the only Jewish state in the world. My dear father, I wanted to see discrimination. I wanted to see the institute, horrible institute that children like me are living here in a Jewish state. I'm discriminated. I'm left behind. My dear father, you did vote for your brother. I continue carrying the name of your brother. He was killed in the war, but I'm here, bleeding in our society. My dear father, are you ready also to shape a better future for me? Are you ready, my dear father, to change the stigma and stereotype, the walls of stigma and stereotype, which envelop me and my friend? You call me in the street retarded. You don't, we do, you don't want my society. You take some of my friends, put them overseas in church, in monasteries, never speak about them. You are shame on our presence. No, my dear father, I never done wrong things. I never steal, never cheated, never manipulated. My dear father, maybe I'm the most Writer's person on earth. I'm the purest on earth, but also at the same time, I'm the weakest. Unable to do anything by my power, unable to eat by myself, to wash myself, unable to say one word, unable to say thank you. My dear father, are you ready to do something for me? So, he shaped my life. He shaped my consciousness. And um, that what it came gradually. It was not a single point. It was not a single moment. It came gradually, step by step, year by year. At first, we moved all over the country looking for some institute. We saw horrible things. Later, we heard many stories of shameful parents. Golda Meir, the Prime Minister, never spoke about her granddaughter, Igal Alon, legendary Major General, the first commander of the Israeli Southern Command, never said a word on Nurit, his daughter, that was born in Kibbutz Genosar. Kibbutz, you listen well, Kibbutz. You know, Kibbutz, is a, you know, we speak about mutual responsibility, like in, in, in special unit, one for all, all for one. Kibbutz, but uh, Nurit that was born in Kibbutz Genosar and described, she's described in, in the book of uh, 
פרופסור אניטה שפירא, the bio of יגאל אלון, she has beautiful child, but the parent decided when she was five years old, the parent decided no place for Nurit in our family, no place in the kibbutz, no place in the state of Israel. Um, this is not the white book of Britain, 1939. That's Igal alone. You know, she was taken to Scotland. She was taken to Scotland and put far away from the state of Israel. And my, my dear son, like saying, whoa, father, what are you doing? So we discover a world of shame and stigma and stereotype. There are many stories like that. And then um, we decided never to hide him. We decided to fight for him. And when I was the commander of the Israeli Southern Command, we got a formal letter from the Israeli Minister of Education. I don't know how much you are worth, but we have in Israel a special education law. What is a special education law? For children like my son. Until now, this is the law, special education law. Special education law say these children are bounded from age three to 21. What does it mean for, from age three? He was diagnosed at the age of eight months. What does it mean? It means if you want uh, special drugs, special medication, psychiatric advice, um, a group, supportive group, nothing. It's, uh, you do it by yourself, number one. That's a three limit. And then when I was the commander of the Israel South Command, it's a letter. Dear Didi and Duron, your son reached 21. He won't be able to continue studying any longer in special education school. What's now? Up to you. It's your problem. We know we the Jewish state, we know you're you're getting older. You're not maybe as strong as you. Uh, when, when you were young, but it's up to you. This is your responsibility. You brought this child to our world. So from 21 and over, it's up to you. Do whatever you want. You want to put him in charge in, min in monastery, overseas, like Eagle alone, up to you. I decided to leave the military and build a village for him. And I'm proud that uh, it, uh, it was a success, a great success. It's still a success. We continue changing Israel's society, but uh, first of all, giving the highest life standard and the best professional treatment for these children. In Ale Negev village, which is named after him, he lived in the village only one year and passed away from rare disease, Castleman disease, which is like the COVID-19. And then he passed away 13 years ago. But in this village, we give them the highest life standard, but above all, love, love, above all. And the second goal, you know, we have one goal, loving them, loving the disabled, giving them the highest life standard. That's number one, but number two, changing Israel society. Make tikkun olam, tikkun olam, tikkun olam, no more discrimination here in Israel, you know, no more racism. And uh, I'm sorry to tell you that we have about 800 volunteers, 500 workers and 800 volunteers. Some of the volunteers arrived from Germany. They are Christian born in Germany, in Berlin, and their grandparents served in the Nazi party. You know, this volunteer from Germany, you know what they say, the same, they say, um, ma, our grandparents killed Jews in Auschwitz, in Dachau, in Buchelwald, and we came for atonement. We come for atonement. Atonement on the murder of six million Jews, atonement on Hitler's decision to kill the retarded and disabled first. I don't know if you're aware, but uh, Hitler issue an order signed by himself named T4 Actia, T4 Action. The T4 Action, which was signed by Hitler September 1st, 1939, the first day of Second World War. What does it say? 
It's a shifting the psychiatric center all over Germany to small concentration camp, gather the retarded, the disabled people, children like our son, kill them first. This is T4 Actia. The volunteers from Germany, Christians from Germany, they're coming say, we come for atonement. Atonement on T4 Actia, atonement on the murder of six million Jews. They say no more discrimination. You know, Christian, they say no more discrimination. So what is uh, this village? This village is, uh, is a hope. Is a hope and uh, it's a mirror of uh, ourselves, of our humanity, of our society. It's a wake up call to us because many wars among people are due the ego, ego, people fighting for their ego. The children in our village uh, have no ego at all, egoless people. And when you come to volunteer or to visit, after one hour you understand, you understand, you get proportion. You understand what is the truth, what is right, what is wrong. You got proportion, you become better human being um, and the more we do volunteer mission with disabled we are better society better human beings and uh, this is the legacy of uh, my beloved son iran and my life is dedicated for disabled like him and you know this combination of my brother was left behind bleeding uh, in the Golanites, in the Yom Kippur War, from one side, and then it seems to me that his soul came to the body of uh, our beloved son. Our beloved son became something like a huge echo box of my bleeding brother without saying one word, just by his presence. So, what is uh, my lesson? My lesson that uh, the weakest in our society, those who are more disabled, more handicapped, more crippled, the weakest in our society, their presence is a supreme test for all of us to see them, to treat them, to love them. And by treating them, walking with them, loving them, we make ourselves better people, better society. And this is the message. And uh, that's my life all about. That's what I'm doing. I continue building the village, continue building a, a new rehabilitation hospital, continue developing a research center, building a research center for disabled people, for people after stroke, after accident, building uh, a neighborhood for workers, for students, for doctors, building a new community for 500 families near Ale Negev village. It's south of Israel. You know, the 60% of the land of Israel is desert. And only 8% of our population living in the desert. So David Ben-Gurion said that the people of Israel will be tested in the Negev, in the desert. He said, follow me. And he moved to Kibbutz Steboker. No many people very few followed him, and Negev still empty. Only 8% of Israel population. We have 9 million, but only less than 1 million living in the Negev. So Ale Negev village is in the Negev. It's Ale Negev. Now Nachalat Iran, Iran's property. So what we do, we do both. Pioneering, flourishing the Negev, building in the Negev, bringing more people, to the Negev. We need doctors and nurses and psychologists and administrators and chefs and communication therapists and hydrotherapists and physiotherapists. Yes, if you have some who wants to, to walk as uh, doctors or nurses uh, in UK, please come and walk. Uh, we are, yes, well, we, <laughs> I'm calling everyone. We need people um, to make uh, this vision happened. We do it, as a matter of fact, but uh, now while building a new rehabilitation hospital, 
in two years and need more 400 people. You know, how, how much difficulty to, to bring doctors and nurses and, and uh, hydrotherapists and physiotherapists. Um, it's very difficult to attract people and, and bring people to, to the Negev. So that's my life. It's dedicated to disabled, to the wounded, to those who injured in, uh, who were injured in, in battle or accident or illness. Um, some of the people arriving off also after the COVID-19 hit them, the coronavirus. Some of them uh, due stress, some of them some neurological problem, muscles problem, brain problem. And um, yes, this is, um, as I said, I believe that uh, working with uh, disabled people, this is a, a huge test. Now, I also believe that uh, we need to start educating people or children to walk with disabled from little age. What does it mean little age? From elementary school, from six years old. Well, what does it mean walk? It's two hours a week, two hours a week being with disabled or being with the elderly person, maybe nursing home, maybe suffering, uh, people suffering aging, so be with them. I want, I want to ask you, what will happen to our society if we build nursing home to elderly people and inside elementary school together or kindergarten together? And children from little age will be together with elderly people. What will happen to us? I tell you what would happen. Yes, it's win-win for the elderly and the children. If uh, a child would come to elderly man or woman and say, I come to visit with you, to be one hour with you, to prepare breakfast, to speak, to help a little bit with the laundry, with cleaning, whatever. What will happen? We'll educate and indoctrinate much better humanity. So, you know, well, we try to take this program. We, we call it Tikkun Olam. Right now we have, uh, with Israeli Ministry of Education, we have uh, a program of Tikkun Olam, indoctrinating students from six years old. We have in Ale Negev a kindergarten for ordinary kids, ordinary kids. And now you can't believe many parents in South of Israel asking us to build more ordinary kindergarten. I'm going to build more six ordinary kindergarten each one for about 20 kids. So just imagine more than 120 ordinary kids from other environment around Ale Negev, village for severely disabled. So these children will be educated, indoctrinated in this Ale Negev village. But it may happen all over, all over. And then, and, you know, and, and this is my vision to have a better world, a better society. There, this is a natural rabbi. <laughs> Ron, I want to say that, um, you know, it's hard to say anything at this stage. Um, you know, I just speak. Um, you've lived uh, an incredible life, um, taken an incredible journey. It's like climbing the uh, Mount Everest in terms of personal um, development. Um, but let me, let me ask you, let me zoom in a little. Let me zoom in a little because I think you are like a diamond. You're an incredible uh, person and, and you're probably not even aware of your achievements because you are so focused on the cause. But when I hear your story, um, I see this as someone who has achieved something incredible and what I want to do is get people to know you better so they can understand how to achieve um, not the same journey, but similar in terms of moving away from the ego, moving away from uh, a, a selfishness to an unbelievable uh, selfless life. Um, I, I can't fathom, and let me go back a little to the brother 
Iran and your son, Iran, obviously the same name, who, as you said, were your great teachers. They were your great teachers. You were the, you were the student and you continue to be the student. But at the same time, you have transformed that to becoming a teacher. So you are teaching the lessons that you learned from your brother and from your son, and you are teaching that to the world. Um, you make it sound very straightforward and almost, almost simple, but it's not. Um, and I just want to zoom in a little on that to help people understand the challenges that you went through to developing, who, becoming who you are, and I'm sure you still go through. So let's talk about your brother a moment. I mean, to, to tragically lose a brother um, is, 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 there's no words that can describe the pain. Um, under those circumstances, as you said, left behind, and it shouldn't have been, and perhaps it could have been avoided, and it wasn't. So there's more pain, more anguish. There must be anger somewhere. There must be anger, I think. That's how human beings respond initially. So you're very extremely upset, and anger is a negative, could be a negative, destructive Emotion and force. Tell, tell, us, tell us moments where you have that pain and anguish and anger and manage to transform that so that you take the anger and the pain and you are going to, and it seems like an inspiration to you, to dedicate your life to becoming one of Israel's greatest commanders. How, how, does, how does that work? Give, give us some moments where it's tough and how you manage to overcome those moments? Um, first of all, I was angry. The first two years after the Yom Kippur War, 1974, 1975, I was frustrated. I was angry. I found myself running alone on the mountain, shouting his name and willing that he, he will appear because it, it it can't be that I will continue living without him. It, 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 it's not reasonable that he is not here. So I was, I was frustrated as hell and, and I wrote songs and I wrote the many documents. Um, I want to tell you another secret. It's not secret. Many people know it. You know, 47 years after the Yom Kippur War, the commanders of my brother never came to my parents. Never came. Never. You know, and, and, and I give lectures to the Israeli high caliber leaders until now, and I'm telling them, I'm telling them, you know, this is um, a part of your commitment. Bereaved family, is apart from the, your manpower order. You should take the bereaved family with you. A letter, a visit. Today I got from, it was in the, the 7th Brigade, to, to get, today I got from one of the NGOs of uh, the 7th Brigade, a telephone call. How are you? She asked me. How are you during this uh, coronavirus? I know you are a brother of uh, Iran. I said, well, okay, thank you for calling. No, no, she said, I'm calling all the parents, all the bereaved parents. Okay, beautiful, thank you. But uh, his commanders never arrived. Not the, the brigade commander, neither the battalion commander, nor the company commander. And first time his friends arrived just a year ago to the memorial service near his grave. So, you know, people in, 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 in Battle shock, people from the, the Yom Kippur War. Yes, yeah, so my frustration never ended. You know, I spoke, I spoke about the first two years. Yes, that was the first two years, but, the, but it didn't finish. And I, I, answering your question, I think I transformed my pain and, 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 and frustration. I transformed it to make a hope, a hope for myself, a hope to our society. So number one, it was continue as commander, 
continue as fighter, continue uh, testing myself in battles, more battles and battles and battles and battles and battles. And I lost many, I told it before, I lost many, many friends during my army service. And I continue. Maybe that was a kind of uh, psychological treatment to myself that I didn't evacuate my brother. I, I dream about evacuation of my brother. I, I always fail in my dream to evacuate him near his burn tank. And uh, the military service and my courage came from the loss of my brother and the guilt feeling that I, I didn't succeed to be with him, to fight with him, to evacuate him. So that, you know, this is something, maybe it's not rational. I was in Sinai, he was in the Golanites, but it does matter, that's me. So he gave me my bleeding brother, living inside me, giving me a lot of power, even today. And, uh, and then, you know, that, that it became a dual effect, a tandem. When our son, who was named after my brother, like continue um, the agony and suffer of my brother, but he is alive. And, um, and he gave me a meaningful life, my son. It's all, it was also a transformation because most of the parents that I read about here in Israel, most of the parents didn't want to mention. They didn't want even to mention, I have retarded son. That was a shame in Israel society. You know, they, they are not part of uh, our economy power. They won't be leaders. For, uh, soldiers, they, they, want, you know, they, they, they will not raise the GDP of our country. So put them in institute and forget. So, and I didn't agree. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree. I will never agree to such a resolution. So, you know, we are not God. We are temporary creature. We come one day, we pass away on the other. You know, we cannot uh, treat them as as if that they are, um, they are not human beings. They are human beings exactly like us, exactly like us. By their present, they're asking us, do you know that uh, you may found yourself, you may find yourself exactly at our position, maybe in a wheelchair, maybe in coma, fully dependent in other people's power. So be aware. Be aware, tol korami benenecha. You know, as it's written by uh, by our uh, wise people, the Chazal and Chachamenu zichonam livracha. Yes, tol korami benenecha. Be be aware. Be careful. Be very careful on human being. You need to have compassion. And um, as as it said. In, in, uh, in our Bible, Olam Chesed Ibane. Olam Chesed Ibane. The, the world will be built by compassion. What does it mean by compassion? You know, okay, we, we, we build world, we build building, we build many things by our technology, by our money, by our energy. What does it mean? The world will be built by compassion. It means that uh, while doing many things by our energy and money and resources and technology, we continue praising our ego. And we may find ourselves fighting one each other, splitting and tearing our societies. And we understand the power of unity only when we become more humble. We become more humble when we stand near the wounded people, the disabled people. So again, um, that's the transformation that I did to myself, you know, answering uh, uh, your question at length. Uh, so that's what I did to myself, transforming the pain and frustration 
to hope. I put the, you know, the, the metaphor, I put the, the frustration and pain behind my back. And here be, behind my face, I try to put hope and move forward toward creating hope. That is by, by the, the, the simpler, simplest metaphor. You know, Daron, it's, it, you're listening to you, um, obviously the key word, um, the key takeaway um, is selfless. And when you say the word selfless, I'm reminded, um, we've taken a lot of trips to Israel. Obviously, many of them have met you. We've brought some soldiers here with the um, spokespersons, the IDF spokespersons department. And I remember a young soldier got up in front of a large crowd, young crowd here in London, and he quoted something that I heard for the first time from Yitzchok Sadeh. So Yitzchok Sadeh obviously was the uh, head of the Palmach, um, an incredible ideologue. Um, and he said the following, I'll say it in English. He said, it, a great soldier is not the one who shows the most courage, but the one who's most selfless. And I think this is what you're saying. Sometimes in life, courage could be a little selfish. But the key soldier is the sacrifice of self, self-sacrifice as we call it, and it's about selflessness. So on that front, let me, let me say this. You know, you, that's what you're trying to teach young people. That's what you're trying to teach Israel society and beyond with the many innovative ways through being more caring and more compassion. And, and you know, Daron, you're certainly on the right path. And I think more and more people will follow. Um, how do you, you know, teaching selflessness, teaching humility, how, how, how do you do that? How do you, what, what are the methods? Because people live a life where it's about what's in it for me. They wake up in the morning, they don't even have to be aware of that. That is who they are. What's in it for me? Even kindness, chesed, as you said before, kindness, deep down, it's what's in it for me. I have to enjoy the kindness. True kindness is selfless kindness. We call, the Chazal call it chesed shel emes. True, which means to say it's not about me. It's about you. How do you teach that? How do you teach that? By action. You, you know, it, it's not by... Uh... It's not a, a, a theory. Yes, of course, there, there is a, there is the theory by by uh, rhetoric, but you need to teach by action, by maase. Uh, what what does it mean by action? I mentioned it before. Volunteer. Yeah, teach children from little age. You know, we say, we say mutual responsibility. We're all responsible one for each other. But we need to translate it to action. You know, if it's just written as title on the wall in the kindergarten or in the classroom, it's not enough. It may be written on the, on the, on, in a classroom on the wall, and you do horrible things. You do horrible things. Uh, uh, just today, there is the news in Israel about rape of youngsters. They, they in a hotel in uh, Elat, um, youngsters as, as 16, 14, 15, uh, raped a young, uh, young girl. She was 15 and a half and uh, drunk and, and they abused her. They are horrible. Horrible, horrible thing. So how you teach people to be mensch, to be human being? How you teach them? How you teach them what is compassion? How you teach them what is love? Love is not sex. Love, you know, love, love is the sensitivity toward those who are fully dependent in our power. It's not about abuse of power. It's not about harassment. Love is a commitment to someone who really needs you every single second of his life. So if you walk with disabled, with those um, 
maybe toward ending their life in, in hospital. Um, if you walk with uh, handicapped, disabled people, you become more sensitive. You discover the compassion. You discover the kindness. And, and you know what? You discover another thing that you're giving toward to those who are fully dependent in, in our power, you discover that you are more given, you rewarded more. But it's happened only later. You start by walking with disabled, and then you come home and say to yourself, Oh, I'm rewarded. I feel rewarded. How many people get home frustrated after a uh, hard day walk, as the Beatles sing, <laughs> and, and frustrated, and feel that they, they, didn't, they didn't did enough. But Daron, let me ask you a question, because you, you are, in a way, the model person where, you know, in, in, in the Kabbalah, there's an expression called Noseh HaFachim, um, combining opposites. Because most people would view experience in the army, a soldier in Israel defending literally the people from enemies who want to destroy it. As we say in every single day, they stand among, upon us to destroy us. So one has to be tough. One has to be daring. One has to have thick skin. You have to be a strong guy, a tough guy, in order to be a good soldier. That's seemingly the way. And you are one of the most, I don't even want to say the word successful, but one of the most heroic soldiers in your leading people into battle and sacrifice and defending lives. Doesn't that make people less sensitive? Doesn't that make people have less patience, less inclusive? It may happen. Some of, uh, some of the soldiers, some of the generals have no sensitivity at all. It may happen, but it also may happen the opposite. Uh, you may see what is sacrifice. You may see also the suffer. You may see what does it mean losing friends. Uh, we, you may see what is bereavement. So, you know, it depends. Yeah, some of, of, of human beings are opaque. They, they are closed. They are sealed. They don't feel. They don't have emotion. Yes, I don't have a formula how to indoctrinate. But um, if you have no heart, and some of the soldiers have no hearts, some of the cruel men have no hearts. Um, so there is no formula. Uh, but I think we, the children of Israel, Bnei Israel, we, the Jewish people, we, we were massacred in the Second World War. Uh, we, we say in, in, uh, in Pesach, Bedamai Chai, we say Bedamai Chai. What does it mean? It means uh, 3,000 years of suffer, 3,000 years of, of tragedies. We need to have sensitivity and compassion and we need to be a model society so we must educate ourselves being soldiers it's, it's also about discipline discipline start by self-discipline how you have the self-discipline how you make yourself disciplined how you become as Gidon the prophet Gidon say um, become a model, example. I don't know about leadership. You spoke about leadership. I don't know what is leadership without personal example. Number one rule, number one rule, personal example. You want people to trust you, to follow you. You want to say people follow me and you want to see them following you coming after you, endangering their life with you, maybe for you, it's only 
if they trust you. And they trust you if they see the truth by your behavior. So number one, number one is personal example. As Gidon said 3,000 years ago, follow me and do the same. So you need to be first. You need to be personal example. This is number one. Number two, of course, you need to have courage. Because as, as commander, as leader, as soldier, as fighter, you, every day, every minute, you endanger your life. You need to be ready to sacrifice. Sacrifice, what is the sacrifice of soldiers? I'm not saying, you know, I did not, no one wants to die. But I'm saying, yes, there's some purpose in our life that we should be ready to give our life for our children, for our nation. I'm not, I don't want to sound naive, but there is only one Jewish state. Yes, 2000 years, our people were scattered in diaspora all over the world. Yes, this Jewish state is only 73 years old. That's all, this is the third temple. I'm the Yom Kippur generation war. You know what is the Yom Kippur generation war? The first, the, the second day that uh, Moshe Dayan, the Ministry of Defense said, uh, there is danger, the third temple won't survive. This is my generation. We have responsibility for the Jewish people. We need to be ready for sacrifice to protect our nation, to protect our country. Yes, it's, uh, it's our responsibility. If we want to guarantee the Jewish people um, and we need to be ready for sacrifice. So leadership, it's also about being ready for sacrifice. So, and number three, I spoke about personal example, sacrifice, courage, love. Love, you know, love, I'm speaking about, I'm, I'm general, a major general in the Israel Defense Forces, I'm speaking about love. If you don't love your soldiers, your families, so you have no heart. If you have no heart, you are not human being. You need to be human being, even as commanders, as fighters, as soldiers. You, know, you can't believe how many times I took um, terrorists after they wounded. I took them back. I brought them to Israel hospital from Gaza Strip, from Lebanon, many times. Yeah, we fought. We didn't kill sometimes. And they're wounded and brought, we brought them to Israeli hospital. Yes, many times. You may say you are naive. That's it. I believe in it. We need to be human, even by behavior. And we, as we say, you know, our Bible, bin fol oivecha al ta'alots. When you kill someone, okay, don't be happy. You know, it's a, uh, when we do it, we do it because we are forced. We need to be, we need to understand we do it by force. And, um, and, and, and killing is not a target. Killing is something, you know, it's, it's last resort. Killing other people, it's last resort. So when you are a soldier in the IDF, the Israel Defense Force, you need to understand that uh, you got the power to kill people, but it's last resort. We need to do our maximum efforts to solve problems, not by power. And another thing that I, I want also to tell you as a rabbi, So, the hero is the one who control is nature, to control your nature. It's also about the self-discipline. And uh, those people who succeed to hold their nature, to be self-disciplined, they can be leaders. They can example, establish a personal example. And that's about leadership. So that's it, about five points.
points I, I raised. Yeah, no, Doron, Doron. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I shouldn't even say enjoyed, um, inspired and challenged. I think that's the right word. Um, challenged by an incredible person. Um, and, and really, I'm not trying to say this to you to flatter you because you're the last person who needs or wants to be flattered. You want to inspire, encourage and challenge other people. Um, before closing, I just want to say, obviously, we're coming up to the new year, to the Rosh Hashanah. Um, this is a new year. Um, the first Lubavitch Rebbe said something interesting. He said, every year there is a greater light, a greater energy that has never existed previously in the world. And that's why it's called a new year, meaning it's never happened before. So we can achieve things that we history has never achieved before. What is your message? If you were speaking to Jewish people in Israel and around the world, what would you be your message to them? And this year obviously is different than all other years in the challenges that the world is facing. To do goodness for people and measure ourselves by our behavior to people and try to measure ourselves every day, every day by doing good things to other people, family, sibling, mother, father, grandpa, grandma, neighbors, trying to assist those who cry, those who stretch their hand, those who look at us and have no power even to say please. So to be better people and every day, every day, before getting to sleep, to ask ourselves how many things, how many times we assist those who need us. Did I walk myself today or did I walk friends, neighbors, disabled people? So that's, um, you know, as a continuation to my words, um, what uh, we need to do, um, we have two flags as a matter of fact. One flag is um, the personal excellency. As, as you know, as Jewish parents, as, as father and mother, we want our children to be excellent, to be the best, the best professor, the best uh, athlete, the, to be the best, number one. Is the, the best doctor, is the best surgeon, number one. Yeah. Okay, high motivation to have high motivation for personal excellency this, this is fine but we need to have another banner the social excellency we are part of society we are not alone in this world so in this respect you know we need to do good things for other people not for myself because before getting to sleep every night ask ask myself how many times today I help people who really need me. And, you know, um, the older we are, the more people suffering around us from illness, from age, whatever, accident. Yeah, so how many times I stop my activity and go assist other people who really need me? So this is my message, loving the disabled, yes, and put them at the right place, not behind, before. Uh, I want another thing that uh, before we, we end our conversation, I want to thank you, Rabbi, but uh, this is, uh, there's one lady, Liron, here with us, she's, uh, yes, Liron from Ale UK, she is the representative of Ale, my organization, in London, we have lay leaders maybe listening to us uh, right now. And uh, I want to ask you also, um, make some connection to, with uh, Liron. Um, I'm inviting you when you come to Israel after this virus is dying, hopefully sooner than later, um, I invite you to come and visit Ale Negev Nachalat Iran, come and volunteer I would love to, to host you. I would love to be in touch with you. 
But mean, meanwhile, uh, Leon may brief you and update you on, on our activities in Israel, on Tikkun Olam, on uh, integrating disabled people in work, finding jobs to people um, after illness or stroke or accident. Uh, we have many activities in Israel. Yes. So Leon is uh, Okay, if, 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 if I could just say a few words and then we'll ask Daron to say a few words. Um, so first of all, um, um, Daron, this is again inspiring every time and most importantly, um, in terms of the audience, many of whom um, we engage on a regular basis, many of them young people, you know, people search in life for joy and happiness and uh, they can go to Mykonos or they can go to Ibiza or anywhere else in the world to, to look for excitement uh, in life. Um, the truth is that the greatest excitement and the greatest joy is, as Daron was saying, when a person reaches out to someone who has nothing to offer, uh, because that is the purest kindness. And as you mentioned, initially, um, you might not get the pleasure because you don't have the feedback in the ways that you do uh, helping other people. But when you do get that response, it is unbelievable. It is like a drug. Uh, it, it becomes addictive. And, um, you know, you, 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 you will, it will change your life. It will transform your life. Um, in, in, in ways that it has um, many people who have done so. So I want to say on, on behalf of the Center for Jewish Life and behalf of Alain Negev and Daron and, and, and Liron, that really we're coming up to the new year. If you want more meaning, purpose, joy in your life, think less about yourself, think more about others, help. And as you said, Daron, very wisely, echoing the words of our sages, who say, sometimes in life, you wait for the feeling and then you act. Um, Judaism says, no, first act, first do that act of kindness to that person who has nothing. And when you do that, that evokes and provokes within you a feeling of love um, that is so powerful that it will transform your life, um, that you will find new purpose and meaning. And I think during these challenging times and before Rosh Hashanah, um, we, we all want to, Einstein once said, you can't expect to get different results if you do the same thing. So if you want real joy in your life, make a commitment to volunteer, to help people purely, genuinely, authentically. And again, you know, this, I think this organization is an organization that is transformational. We will share also the link on Facebook for all those people to Alain Negev, uh, people who want to volunteer eventually, people who want to donate, people who want to get involved. Um, let me tell you something, it will change your life um, for the good. So before we invite Laurent, Laurent to say a few words, I want to thank um, Daron for his time and uh, again, an inspiration to many. Uh, I would say you are a major general, um, head of the Southern Command, leading all those t uh, daring battles, military operations. But I think perhaps your greatest achievement is uh, being the leader of the Gibor, the courageous man according to the definition of the Pirkei Avot Ethics of Our Fathers is the self-discipline that is really true greatness. So Daron, we thank you very much um, for participating tonight. And um, just uh, um, a few words from Liron. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Vogel. Thank you, Daron. I'm always amazed, I have to say, how inspired I am after listening to Daron, and I've heard him so many times before. Um, and every time I learn new things and I'm moved. So thank you very much, Daron, for that. Um, so just to say, um, to, um, I'm based in London and I'm the director of the British Friends of Ale. Um, we, the British Friends of Ale, support the amazing work of Daron in Israel 
uh, and the amazing work of Ale in Israel. Um, and we invite uh, uh, people to join us in our efforts to Tikkun Olam and uh, to support the wonderful children of Ale in Israel. Uh, we have um, a wonderful lay leadership team here in London. Um, and if you're interested to hear more about that, we are currently looking for new members to join our lay leadership here. Uh, our board of trustees and our different committees I'm more than happy to tell you more about that. You can find all my details. Uh, probably Rab uh, Rabbi Vogel could, could share it, right? Yes. Thank you. You could please contact me um, if you'd like to support Ale in any way um, through donations, through volunteering, um, to join our international volunteering programs that like Ron mentioned when this pandemic is finally over. Um, and uh, yeah, speaking of uh, acts of kindness, and uh, this is a, an amazing opportunity to do that. Um, thank you very much, and uh, Shana Tova to everyone. Yes. Shana Tova. Shana Tova, before we leave, again, on behalf of everyone at the Center for Jewish Life and everyone watching, we'd like to wish Daron, Liran, and that amazing organization, Alena Gev, uh, that is bringing kindness, uh, true kindness, if I may say, to the world and really transforming the world. So Shana Tova to everyone, and may it be a year filled with much blessing, sweet uh, peace and security in our lives. Thank you very much, Daron, once again. Uh, have a wonderful evening. And a Shana Tova. Thank you. Shana Tova, Gmar Hatima Tova, Amen. Shana Tova, thank you.